Okay, so what I wanted to talk about today is the role that artificial intelligence and automation will play with news organizations. Is it is it an aid to the kinds of strategic initiatives the news organizations seek to pursue, or is it just an excuse to eliminate journalism jobs? And along the way, I'm going to talk about the types of artificial intelligence we're actually talking about and the ways that it can be used already by news organizations and maybe some of the challenges that are yet to come. So I want to start by saying it is impossible to separate technology and journalism. We, we can't. We, especially in the United States, when we talk about the constitutional role of journalism and news, we actually talk about it in the context of the press, which just meant the physical device used to push down, you know, lead type and then other forms of type onto paper. And so technology has always played a role, not just in how journalism is created, but also in how it's distributed. And the role of technology in journalism is, you know, the, the changes have come later and more quickly than maybe you think about. So I love as a sort of counterpoint to where we are technically today, to look at the last town crier who in 1926 stopped riding his horse and in 1928 stopped bicycling the streets of San Antonio shouting the day's news. It was baseball box scores, it was what was going on and eventually his poor health and the annoyance of the citizens of San Antonio brought an end to the town crier. But what I'm saying is at the same time that the United States still had town criers who were sharing the news by shouting into a megaphone, we also had nascent radio and nascent television. So a lot of the technical innovation is really clumped together into a very narrow period that starts in the 1920s and goes over the last hundred years. Before that, you had voice, you know, people telling you what was going on, and you had print. And after that, in the next hundred years, you had virtually everything else, everything we think of as a news distribution system. So the birth of live audio, and then eventually with podcasts and, and digital audio clips, asynchronous audio, video, social media distribution, interactive graphics, all of these different technologies have all sprung up in the last hundred years, even though we have thousands of years of printed news experiences and, and even longer of voice transmission of the news. So this role that technology plays is increasingly rushed in terms of how quickly the changes are happening. And I really love this quote because I think it really helps us understand what the technical changes in media might mean. So, you know, we are in a truly amazing period today in mass communication in general life as we knew it two decades ago has changed vastly. Technology is blurring the traditional definition of communications media. That feels really relevant, right? I mean, at least it does to me. It really speaks to the moment we're in, except that when Bruce Garrison wrote this at the University of Miami, it was 1983. So what was going on in 1983 that was so incredibly disruptive to the ways that people communicated and was really changing life as we knew it, especially media as we knew it? Well, it was the personal computer. And so these, these really dramatic shifts in how we think about what journalism is and the ways that technology impacts the kinds of journalism that we practice, they're not new. When we introduced the personal computer, you have to believe that newsrooms shifted almost as much as they did when we introduced the mobile phone and almost as much as we're starting to adopt these AI style techniques. And so I think a good way to think about the impact of the personal computer is to look back at this incredible diagram of the Evening Stars building. So this was an afternoon newspaper in Washington, DC. And in the early 1920s, they built a state of the art newsroom, not unlike the New York Times bragging about Renzo Piano designing their newsroom or the Washington Post showing the open concept, maybe not so great for COVID newsroom that they built with Jeff Bezos's funds. This is a map of how the Evening Stars building worked. Not every floor here is specifically relevant to the newspaper, but there was a shocking amount of it that is. And there are some things that today seem almost comical. So can you imagine a world in which people walk to a newspaper building to place a classified ad? You know, obviously Craigslist, eBay, Facebook Marketplace have all completely disrupted that way of doing business. Then you needed this giant composing operation that was filled with linotype machines. 
And finally, I don't know if you notice those pipes, but those are pneumatic tubes, like maybe you would have seen at a bank or a pharmacy, except that all they did was help move different pieces of printed material from one part of the newsroom to another part so that they could be printed on presses that are down at the bottom of this diagram. And so I'm graying out all the parts that are sort of less relevant. So the fact that most newsrooms don't have a cafeteria is no big deal. The fact that none of us have a club room is not shocking. And then there are some other businesses that were part of the building, but even just looking at the things that aren't grayed out, there is a massive amount of effort that it took to generate the news and to print the news. And if we think about what the personal computer meant is that it eliminated almost all of these different parts of the building. So what are you left with? You're left with a city room where reporters report information. You're left with some advertising agencies where they produce ads that appear today digitally, but then in print. But so many other parts, the print distribution, the linotype machines, the classifieds, uh, the ink storage, a lot of people who had jobs around pasting up of the newsroom or hand drawing different things, all of those were replaced by the personal computer. And so when we have this conversation about what is the impact of AI on newsrooms, one of the things you have to remember is that this is not the first time that newsrooms were drastically disrupted by technology. And really, we could say the same thing about the advent of first radio and then television, which also dramatically disrupted at least legacy print newsrooms. And the other thing that I want to talk about is I want to talk about the ways that we have thought about, at least historically, about artificial intelligence. So on one hand, in the 50s and 60s, there was this sort of joyous idea that we didn't call it artificial intelligence, but that robotics would positively change our lives. And Rosie was maybe cruelly treated by the Jetsons, but served all of their needs in a you know, way that was not only harmless, but actually incredibly positive. Fast forward to today, there are lots of people who look at artificial intelligence much more like Terminator, these sort of vicious sentient beings that realize that they're, if not better than us, at least in competition with humanity and, and maybe can even eliminate humanity so that the machines can rule themselves. And the challenge is that when we talk about AI, we're not really talking about one thing. And I know that this is no surprise to any of you, but what we're really talking about are a whole series of different techniques that can be broadly classified in one of two ways. So Rosie and the robots from Terminator, Skynet in general, is really a general form of AI, a form of AI that chases sentient thought, that has creativity, potentially emotion, that operates almost without human instruction, or, or only loosely based on human instruction. How much general AI do we have today? Approaching zero. No one has been able to create consciousness in machine systems, or if we have, we haven't realized it yet. And every time you ask Siri something and she doesn't understand, or they don't understand, every time that you say something to your echo and then it accidentally sets a timer or randomly pulls out a piece of information from the web that has nothing relevant to what you're doing, what you're really seeing is different forms of narrow AI masquerading as general AI. And the reason that these narrow forms of artificial intelligence that masquerade as general AI are so unsatisfying is because the machine isn't really thinking. It's just following patterns and rote instructions. And we ask it the kinds of questions we would pose to general AI, but with narrow AI that fails almost completely. So what is narrow AI? Well, narrow AI is of a wide variety of things, some of which feel really groundbreaking today and lots of which don't. So the ability to spell check or grammar check a written sentence is definitely narrow AI, but it doesn't feel particularly special anymore because we take it for granted. As the AI community solves one narrow AI problem, we just sort of lump that in with technology. And the problem that is just sort of out of our reach or just being solved still feels like AI. When AI systems won at Jeopardy or won at chess or won at Go, they seemed dramatic and amazing. When you play computer games with non-player characters or you play against a computer or against a console game, it doesn't feel that special, but that's also AI. So narrow AI has a lot of different applications for journalism. 
general AI has a lot of potential impact on journalism and society, but it basically doesn't exist yet. And it's still unclear if it does at all, how soon it would. So when we talk about journalism and when we think about the role that AI plays in journalism, there are sort of four key questions that we ask ourselves. How can artificial intelligence help journalists find stories or find elements for stories or help to prepare those stories? How can AI help us shape the journalism in ways that fit the audience's need at a particular moment and in a particular place? And can we get the journalism, the stories that we create into the hands of people when and where they're ready for them or interested in doing it? And finally, can artificial intelligence help us support the storytelling? We know that great journalism doesn't come for free, doesn't come instantly, doesn't come easily. So we need to be able to support in lots of different ways, the journalists who wanna create the stories that we need to consume. So those four categories I would roughly break down as creation, consumption, and distrib distribution and monetization of journalism. A lot of my work fits into these four categories and a lot of the work we do at the Night Lab is deliberately meant to be framed this way. And I think that you'll find that there may be other forms of narrow AI, but almost everything that exists today and that will exist in the near future falls into one of these four categories. So what do these four categories look like? Well, around creation, if you think about this situation, which you've probably seen many times, either on TV or on the West Wing, or maybe even sat in these seats yourself, this is the White House briefing room. And if you look at the White House briefing room a generation ago, almost all of these people would have had just a notepad in their hand and a pen. And if you look around this room, you see lots of phones, some microphones, and almost no pens. Why? Because today, artificial intelligence is allowing us to transcribe in almost real time so that reporters who are in a briefing room, instead of writing in a pad and then rushing off to find a phone to call their editors, instead they're recording, auto-transcribing, and tweeting while they try to think about what they're gonna write next. So creation artificial intelligence tools can not only help us with things like transcription, but they can also help us find patterns within data. They can alert us to different forms of news that are important, whether they're on social channels or they're published by a competitor. They can help reporters and editors as they think by posing questions that you might need as you're trying to report out a story. And the form of consumption raises some really interesting questions. So historically, the value of something like a printed front page or even the homepage of a news website often was that it was the editorial judgment of the news organization framed for everyone. So everyone had a singular understanding of what was and wasn't important. That was really blown up by things like Netflix. No one has, or almost no one has the same Netflix queue the same Netflix recommendations. So where does that put us today? Artificial intelligence is making it possible for news organizations to truly personalize the kinds of content that they create and distribute. But that runs counter to this longstanding belief that part of what news organizations offer their audience is a singular sense of editorial judgment. So consumption both enables news organizations to put stories in forms that might be more compelling and more interesting to their audience, but it does so at the risk of dividing that audience and giving them such different experiences that maybe we don't collectively share a moment of news the way we did historically. And distribution is increasingly difficult. News organizations are telling their stories not only in their legacy forms, not only on their websites and mobile apps, but also on dozens of different social channels and in different forms. So you might be telling the same story on Instagram as you are on Snapchat Discover or in an email newsletter or an Apple News. And artificial intelligence can play a really critical way in both determining where it is most important to distribute the journalism, but also what channels are going to be most effective for what individual users. And so we can already see ways 
that AI is really helping to make this important match between what news audiences want and where they want it. And one of the most critical and rapidly changing areas of, of journalism and digital media is around monetization. Even five years ago, most news organizations, if they were making money off of their digital journalism, were making it off of advertising or sponsorship. Today, lots of them are making money off of advertising and sponsorship, but also subscriptions or membership. Before AI, news organizations were really limited in how they could price. And gas stations are a great example of this. Maybe you pay a slightly different price for credit than cash, but effectively, Gas is all the same quality and all advertised by price. On the other hand, people on an airline are often sitting on the same flight, same plane together and paying wildly different amounts. Before artificial intelligence, it was almost impossible to offer that kind of different pricing. It was almost impossible to identify users who might unsubscribe. It was almost impossible to model which users were more valuable to a particular advertiser. But all artificial intelligence enables all of those things today so that news organizations can make more money than before off of their digital audiences. It may not be as much money as they used to make off of their legacy audiences, but in some ways it's more honest money in the sense that with legacy news, you were really counting on either a panel to suggest how many people were listening to or watching journalism, or in the case of print, a wild guess about how many people were reading or passing along an individual piece of content. So today we have much clearer ideas about how and where you can make money. And I want to look at some examples from my own experience at the Washington Post. When in 2013, Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post, one of the things he came in and said is that the legacy model of the Post was no longer effective. Whether you're talking about print subscriptions, print advertising, um, classified businesses, the internet had eliminated all of those. And the Post was suffering through all of the challenges that that internet-oriented disruption brought, but had failed to take advantage of the gift that the internet had to offer. And that was twofold. One, we could use technology in new and novel ways, and we hadn't. And two, the cost of acquiring new users was approaching zero. That creating digital journalism for one user or for 100 million users was effectively almost the same. And what you saw in the post growth when Jeff bought the post, domestically, the post had about 25 million unique visitors per month. And in the last year, it averaged between 85 and 100 million you see that the internet has enabled the post to create better and better journalism distributed more effectively than it had ever been before. So how do we use AI at the post to serve some of these challenges? Well, one thing that we did is we focused on the use of machine generated content for uh, better coverage. So in, historically, the post had covered the Olympics, the post had covered elections, but the way that they covered these things was a combination of human written stories that were focused on features and human written stories that were focused on information. The human written stories that were focused on information. So in the case of the Olympics, what events were coming up, who had fared how in which events, uh, what the medal count was, these were very rote and mundane tasks. It was much the same as the way that the Post had covered national elections. The Post had covered about 30% of all the elections, almost all of them with templated stories written by humans based off of AP data. Well, in both cases, those, those tasks that were data shaped were much better done by machines. But there was an interesting opportunity that the Post had not considered because what effectively we were doing was using humans to perform the tasks that machines could, but replicating what humans would have done if the post had had 500 writers to cover every House and Senate and gubernatorial race. And instead, using artificial intelligence tools, we were able to create living stories, which were very different than the way that we thought about traditional stories. A living story existed at the same URL, but changed based on the data that we had at that particular moment. And so that required creating a new system and the system was called Heliograph. And Heliograph looked for data in the observation phase. It understood what was new about the data in the detection phase. And then it was able to write not one story, but many stories, depending on the needs of what our distribution looked like. 
and pushed out those stories over lots of different channels. So initially, WordPress and Twitter were much more traditional style stories. Even though we could write and rewrite those WordPress stories, they still looked a lot like traditional news stories, even though they were evolving. But for example, with the Amazon Echo and Facebook Messenger, it was a two-way conversation where users could ask questions and the system could dynamically generate the answers that were needed at that particular moment. And these living stories could really adapt to different stages of the process. So for example, in a primary, we could start with a primary election preview that said, here are the candidates that are running, here's the fundraising that they did, here's the likelihood if we have polling data that they would win or lose. And then at the same URL that shifts, depending on the type of primary you have, whether it's a partisan primary, Democrat versus Republicans, or a, two, a top two nonpartisan primary, or even a jungle primary. And then as the story moves through the process, it continues to change and evolve. The headlines change, the text change, the impact on the election changes phase after phase, and then moves smoothly from primary to general election. And so this is a very different model of storytelling that is only possible because we were using artificial intelligence tools. And by continually, evol continually evolving the story at a singular URL, another thing we did is signal to Google that we are an expert in a particular congressional election in a way that a series of stories might not because each one individually wouldn't really signal that kind of expertise. And you can look at different forms of storytelling using artificial intelligence. So in this case, the brand studio team at the Washington Post, which is advertising related content, looked at first party data. And this particular advertiser, which I believe was Netflix, really wanted to show users video. But we realized that showing users video was only effective if they were interested in watching video. And so what we did is we took signals from their other consumption patterns on the Washington Post site. And if they had already been watching video, we put the video at the top. If they had engaged with informational graphics, we might put that at the top. If they engage with photo galleries, those would be higher up. And if they were just a reader, then even though Netflix wanted people to see video, we might as well engage them first with text because that was going to be the way that they were most likely to consume. And we looked at things like how could we surface background information when it mattered, but not when it didn't. So this would enable us to be more respectful of the interests of the audience. For example, when reading about technology stories, there's a lot of jargon. And the jargon requires a repetitive definition every time the writer writes a story. However, if your audience is already familiar with net neutrality, why force them to slow down as you pause to define it? So instead, what we did is we built in contextual information. So we built an AI system that not only had a glossary of terms, but that automatically linked those terms whenever those terms appeared on first use in a news story. And so in that way, we're saving the reporter's time, we're saving the audience time, but we're still making available the contextual information if someone needs it. And the post explored different ways to use AI for distribution. So this particular project, which took place after I left the post for the 2020 election, looked at how can we bridge together several different AI techniques. So the first AI technique was creating machine generated content off of data. So what is the state of the election right now? The second AI technique was dynamically inserting, well, well was translating that text to speech and then dynamically inserting that speech into podcasts. And then the third technique was geolocating the user who was consuming the podcast and then automatically serving them something that was relevant to their area. So let me see if I can play you an example of how this worked. This is your Washington Post election 2020 results update. I'm Claire, elections AI presenter for the Post. Here are the latest national race results for Illinois as of 12:10 p.m. Eastern on Saturday, November 7th. So far in congressional races, Democrats have won 12 congressional districts. Republicans have won five districts. One district remains to be called. In the race for U.S. Senate, Democrat Dick Durbin won the Senate seat. The other Senate seat is held by Democrat Tammy Duckworth. In the race for president, Joe Biden won the 20 electoral votes from Illinois. Across the country, Joe Biden has won 273 electoral votes and President Donald Trump has won 214. 
270 electoral votes are needed to win the presidency. Trump is mounting legal challenges to the vote in key states. Thanks for listening. See? These results will be updated frequently and are taking longer this year in some states due to increased mail-in voting. Race calls are made according to data from Edison Research and the Associated Press. So you can really see how artificial intelligence allows from the, the newsroom of the Washington all Post. Of these different aspects. Hello, hey you. Here's Louisa back from the And on monetization, one of the most important developments recently is the dynamic paywalls that increasingly you're seeing news organizations like the Globe and Mail, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, all trying to use. And what they're essentially doing is trying to determine who and when you want to show paywalls to, to different kinds of users based on their behavioral patterns. And so as we think about the role that artificial intelligence can and will play, there are all kinds of challenges that we have not yet figured out. It's increasingly important to put photo and video with every text-based story. So artificial intelligence can help us not only select the most relevant photo or video, but also one that hasn't been regularly used before, or maybe even check our own bias about who appears in these photos or videos. It can help us think about what kinds of stories need background information and in which cases we can leave it out so that, or minimize it, so that users can be much more effective and efficient in their reading. It can help us translate stories into different languages or translate different languages into the language that we speak so we can include the voices of different people in our stories. It can even help with reading level. We've been working on projects at the Night Lab where we have been using machines to try to translate complex stories into simpler language that fits different educational levels and different experiences with topics. And we can even think about a future in which artificial intelligence enables much more efficiently micropayments. So maybe even if you can't afford to pay for a subscription, we could dynamically price individual articles so that we can still support the journalism without necessarily imposing taxes on those who can't afford it. And so back to the original question, so where do we stand? Do we have this sort of benevolent AI that is helpful in building newsrooms, or do we have a, a much more frightening and threatening form of AI that is going to negatively impact the journalism and the journalists that we care about? It's really hard to know. We know that general AI is not around the corner. We know that the tools that we'll be looking at are not narrow AI systems, but those systems can still have very challenging impacts on newsrooms. The thing I think we do know is that we have a lot left to figure out. And I think if you go back to that Bruce Garrison quote about the impact of personal computers in 1983, and then you look ahead 30 years later at the emergence of smartphones, I think we'll see a really interesting pattern. So I wanna close with letting Steve Jobs explain something that felt to him very special at that time. All right, now I wanna show you something incredible. So let's go to the web. I'm gonna load in the New York Times. It's kind of a slow site because it's got a lot of images, but here we are loading it. We're loading it over Wi-Fi right now. And rather than just give you a WAP version of the New York Times, rather than give you this wrapped version all around, we're showing you the whole New York Times website, and there it is. This is really great, and I can see the whole page, but of course I can't read it, it's a little too small, so I can get in with my fingers and pinch it, there is the New York Times. And again, any article I want, boom, there we go. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, right? You know what's unbelievable? It's unbelievable that anyone thought we wanted to look at a tiny screen and see the whole New York Times, right? So what is very clear is that smartphones have absolutely transformed our industry, the ways that journalists create, consume, the ways that we pay for and what we value in journalism. And it is very clear that in 2013, Steve Jobs, one of the most prescient technology thinkers of all time, had no idea what we would need today. And it's not even that long. It's only been eight years. And so I would say the same about artificial intelligence. It's very clear that we don't know yet and that the things that we think are important right now will probably feel fairly mundane in very little time. Already people are used to in Gmail and other email apps, auto composing. So maybe we'll see much more machine generated content. Maybe we'll see much deeper personalization. 
What I think is clear is that if we come back in eight years, we will not have accurately predicted what the impact would be or what we really want out of this technology. But it is very clear that everything we do in journalism will be shaped by these new technologies, just in ways that we can't expect yet. So thank you very much. I'm glad to take questions if there are some. Thank you so much, Jerry. That was really Jerry. <laughs> Jeremy, I'm sorry. I was reading way too anything. fast. <laughs> um, we do have a question from Caitlin. Would you be able to elaborate a bit more on how AI plays into podcasting if you have anything more to add? Well, sure. So I think AI plays into podcasting in a couple of different ways that are interesting and, and not yet fully shaped. So um, let me give you a couple of examples. So one, one thing that has really changed podcasting in the last three to five years is the ability to insert dynamically different kinds of ads. It might not be the thing that you jump at first, but one of the big challenges is that historically, and you know, five, 10 years ago, ads had to be baked into the podcast. So when you release the podcast on the RSS feed, the ad revenue that you gleaned would be the same that you had forever wasn't easy to track whether more impressions were made. It wasn't easy to charge people later. And certainly if that advertiser no longer wanted to be associated with the content, you had no choice. So dynamic ad insertion was really important. And dynamic ad insertion is the reason or the technology behind it is the way that the post was able to insert this geolocated content updates. So I think we'll see those tools move seamlessly from advertising to editorial content as well. So we'll be able to shape and personalize what a podcast sounds like, depending on the interests of audience members. Maybe someone wants a shorter version, maybe someone wants a longer version, using the same technology that enables ad serving today. That's one thing. A second thing is the tools of text-to-speech are getting much better, much faster than I think any of us would have imagined or expected. We're moving away from these really computerized voices. So how is this valuable? For example, at the Washington Post, there are a number of different columnists who essentially have to get up at four or five in the morning to record themselves reading their own content. We can get to a point pretty soon where they can digitize their own voices and the machine, the minute they finish writing, could read it aloud. That raises lots of questions. I'm not saying it's automatically a positive thing or it's not without complexity. Who owns that voice? For how long do they own it? In what ways can they use it? All of those are real challenges. But the fact that we can do this is really positive and would offer a much more compelling, much more personally branded version of the news than everything played in the same digitized voice. Finally, teams like the Microsoft News Lab are doing incredible work using in voice to speech technology or text to voice technology where they can do translations. So in your own voice, you can speak in different languages, which also, again, really transforms the possibility of how you tell these kinds of stories. So I think all of those are really exciting AI developments that will dramatically change how we think about podcasts and audio. Second, so our second question, and thanks for that. Uh, any thoughts on the ethics behind dynamic paywall pricing determined by AI? I'm, I'm really conflicted about the ethics of this. And the reason that I'm really conflicted about it is that I think there are these twin important values at stake here. I tend to believe, not that nonprofit journalism isn't good and not that some government supported media like PBS and Voice of America and NPR, which are mostly privately supported, but somewhat publicly supported aren't good. But I, I think in general, it is safer when news organizations create value that can be recognized financially so that they can maintain independence. So in that way, I'm excited about dynamic paywalls and dynamic pricing, because I think it will help in some ways to get the people who can afford to pay to pay more. That's good. On the other hand, I'm really worried about a democratic process where Paywalls are so hard and so fixed that poor quality news or even things that are sort of news looking but are frankly propaganda are what most people have access to and the rich have access to high quality news. That is not a healthy place for our democracy or for any democracy or any representative government. So I think that's really the challenge is that we have to find ways to support the news organizations, but not to do so in a way that if you can't afford it or you can't prioritize it, that you don't get high quality, high value news. And I don't think we have completely thought that through. 
and I don't know what will happen there. Ad supported made it a little bit easier for people to, to get access to journalism, even though sometimes the experience wasn't great. Paywalls really do make that harder. Great, thank you. What are some of the limits of artificial intelligence? Thank you, Maddie. You know, I, I talked about it at the beginning. The real limit is that we have to stop imagining systems that are like the movie Her. You know, we just don't have these general purpose AI systems. It would be nice to have a virtual assistant that could do everything. But instead, we need to think about AI in much more narrow, much more targeted ways. And that for the kinds of AI we have today, it really is much closer to automation than it is creative thought. So that's absolutely a limitation. The other thing you have to think about is how much time does it take to set up an AI system to do a task relative to the amount of time it would take humans to do that task? If the answer is you're doing that task constantly and repetitively, then it's probably worth using AI. If the answer is, in truth, you occasionally do the task, it may well be that setting up an AI system to automate it might actually take you longer and take more effort and more maintenance than just having humans do the task. So you have to be much more conscious in your planning phase about what you're hoping to achieve and how regularly you use the system. Great, thank you. Um, on the ethics front, if the tech is dominated by non-news media companies, how do we avoid falling into inherent traps, bias in the source data, et cetera, that were embedded before we adopted the tools? You know, it's, it's a trick both ways. Um, at the post, we could afford to, and for lots of reasons, we did pursue building our own AI systems. That is in and of itself a little bit of a trap. It requires very different resourcing, and you can't, you can't overstate the amount of maintenance you end up having to do. The data sources change, code is imperfect, developers leave. It takes a lot of documentation, a lot of time to support building your own systems. On the other hand, how much do you want to be dependent on other third-party companies, either startups that may or may not last or big technology companies that may not always have your interests in mind? This is a very, very difficult thing to, to do. The kinds of AI systems that are important for, say, finding stories or sorting through, I didn't even really talk about in the creation process, something like the Pandora project had you know, more than 10 million documents. You can't get through that without using natural language processing tools. It's almost impossible without search algorithms. So to what degree are you willing to expose the kinds of reporting that you're doing to these third-party companies so that you can more efficiently and effectively sort through the information? That's a huge, huge challenge. Historically, when we got these kinds of big data leaks, we used air gap computers. And in, in some cases, if we had even inside a Faraday cage so that no one knew it was there. Today, it's a lot harder. Some of these algorithms can be run locally and some can't. Some really depend as we move to cloud computing on servers that aren't in your control. And so I think it is a really difficult question to know about which things do you have to do yourself. What I would say is, in general, if it feels really confidential, then don't trust it to the cloud, don't trust it to third party sources. If it feels like you're taking data, for example, from high school sports and translating it into text, it's probably fairly safe if it's in the hands of a third party. Great, thank you. Gary, you have your hand raised. Why don't you? Uh, yeah, uh, Jeremy, when you were describing things like um, the Washington Post AI was using users past behavior, like did they click on video or, or graphics or whatever to decide how to create their page and what to surface to the top. What would you say is like, the largest paper news organization that could afford to do that? You know, is it the, can the 50,000 circulation paper do this? Does it have to be a Washington Post owned by Jeff Bezos? You know, who can, who can use that? I mean, I, I think there are, there are two answers to that question. If you're building it yourself, you need a fairly sizable engineering and data science team. If you're using third-party tools, and there are third-party tools that can help you with a lot of this, then no problem. I mean, there are clever plugins and extensions for WordPress that enable you to do some of those things, some. Uh, and I think even more than the sort of first-party data that we were using for signaling, I think reference path, you know, where are you incoming to that page, can be just as strong a signal, and that only takes you know one piece of data. So I think that kind of customization is definitely 
possible in in systems that you use rather than systems that you buy and that allows you to get smaller and smaller and smaller i also think as more and more journalists work on external third-party platforms like substack or youtube for their publishing you start to be very dependent on what that platform enables but I would not be surprised at all, and I don't have inside information about it, if you start to see platforms like Substack starting to say, you know, this is a person who's spending a lot of time, what's the version, what's the long form version of your newsletter? These are people who are sort of skimming it, what's the short form version of your newsletter with the ability to click through to the long form? So I think you'll start to see more and more of that in third party systems that right now don't enable it. So that will make it a lot easier for small newsrooms. I would not encourage you to build your own AI systems unless you're absolutely sure that there is nothing out there first that you can use. Because unless it's highly confidential, it's a lot easier to have someone else support you than to build the support team yourself. Good, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions, please raise your hand or pop in the chat. We're wrapping up and headed toward the lunch hour. So um, I really appreciate everyone's attendance and patience um, here. Uh, so giving you kind of a chance for a question. Uh, let me ask you something, Jeremy. Um, this was a lot of interesting information, but in layman's terms, if you could sum up the big takeaway um, as what would that be? That tough one. Don't be don't be afraid of AI just because it's AI. Don't assume that AI has to be incredibly complicated. Think about problems and then look not so much for AI but specific techniques to solve those problems. You know, if your newsroom is still spending time hand transcribing their notes, you need AI, but just a narrow form of transcription. If your newsroom is spending a lot of time fixing style errors, then you need a simple form of style checking like you have grammar or spell check. If your newsroom is having a big problem with churn, then maybe you need a different modeling system to identify at-risk subscribers. Uh, these, these kinds of problems can be solved by fairly simple forms of AI. And that the trick is that when they become simple enough to us, they don't feel like AI anymore. So we just always look farther out at more complex problems. So, AI is another tool, just like personal computers and mobile devices. And if you're not using it already, I'd be surprised. You're probably just not characterizing it that way. Great, thank you. Um, just last call, I'm not seeing any additional questions in the chat or any additional raised hands. Um, this was wonderful, thank you so much. Um, a couple of announcements and then I do have one uh, final question for you. However, someone snuck in there, thank you, Margaret. Please, what app will you recommend? Well, so, you know, for transcription, uh, we used at the post, we looked at a number of different systems. We really like Trint, T-R-I-N-T. Um, I think I wanna double check that I'm spelling that right. Uh, but there are a number of different systems like it. Yeah, T-R-I-N-T.com. Uh, Trint really worked fairly well for us. It was good with accents, which is one thing to look at. You know, it's, if, if you know, I'm in Chicago now, if you're a good Midwesterner, almost everybody, you know, growing up speaking English, almost everybody recognizes you, but lots of people you interview won't be in that situation, or maybe you yourself are not in that situation. So the one thing to really look for when you look at transcription is, you know, can it recognize your accent and the accents of people? So what we did was fairly simple user testing. We asked people who had hand transcribed their notes to upload the audio if they had it, and we just compared them. And we sort of looked at different systems with these different how did you transcribe your notes and how did the system transcribe your notes and pick the system that was the combination of the best in terms of getting it right with the price that we could afford. Uh, but I, I, I like Trent, uh, I thought it was pretty good, but there are others. And in some cases we use Google, in some cases we used Amazon, just sort of depending on what the project was. Some of those systems like Google and Amazon have APIs. So if you have developers who are gonna do it for you, that's great. Trent is a system that makes it pretty easy as long as you don't store too much up there and pretty affordable to do the translation even if you have no technology skills or developers in-house. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much. A couple announcements don't go away, Jeremy. Um, to remind everybody, we'll resume here. Um, and if you go to the lobby at one o'clock, um, please enjoy your lunch break. Um, we will stay around. So if anyone needs anything, please let us know. Um, you are so welcome to hang out here with Jeremy, not Jerry, um, in this uh, breakout room for the next 
however long he's willing to stay. A um, couple of reminders, we will um, also have our sessions tomorrow, some really great lineup. And if you're willing to come, we are willing to raffle off um, Starbucks gift card in an amount of $50. It's crazy. So um, that will be available to you. Um, meanwhile, uh, last question, Jeremy, it is kind of fun. Everyone, please feel free to answer in the chat, but I'm putting you on the spot. Um, would you rather watch nothing but Hallmark Channel Christmas movies or nothing but horror movies? Here's the please thing. Please, everyone, feel free to answer in the chat. <laughs> My three doors down neighbor works for the Hallmark Channel. And so I have become very loyal to the Hallmark Channel because everyone makes fun of it. Now I confess when I watch, I still make fun of it, but um, I would pick, I would definitely pick Hallmark for that reason, just because I'm very loyal to, uh, to the wards who are down the street. I just want to put a sh thank you very much for that awesome answer. I want to put a shout though, to all of those haters who hate these questions. This is why I ask them, who would have thought you would live three doors up from the person on the Hallmark thing. So please, uh, thank you so much for humoring me on this. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you everyone for your attendance so far. We will reconvene at one. Um, Jeremy, if you wanna hang out for a little bit and see if anyone wants to hang out with you. Frank, you're like horror, huh? All right. <laughs> so you I, live I won't away be from- offended if you wanna go eat lunch, but uh, I'm glad to chat more <laughs> about AI if you have time. Great, thank you so much. And Jeremy, great coming. presentation. Thank you, appreciate you. Thanks for having me. <laughs>